Hello, everyone. My name is Nahed Mansour, and I'm the Curator of Programs and Education at the Gardner Museum. Welcome to our three work series. You will notice your mics and videos are muted and the chat option has been disabled. However, there will be a Q&A following today's conversation, and so we invite you to send us questions through the Q&A function at any point. As you may notice, closed captioning is also enabled. Please note that the closed captioning is automated and any information that appears is not reviewed for accuracy. Instructions on how to disable the closed captioning will be shared in the chat box. We're also recording today's program. Um, sorry, we're also recording today's program and it is being live uh, streamed through Facebook Live. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto is located on the treaty lands and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Pitoon, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. The community we work in is the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to learn and live on this land. Today, we are very excited to welcome Khalil Robert Irving as our guest speaker. He will be in conversation with Sequoia Miller, the Gardner Museum's Chief Curator and Deputy Director. Khalil will discuss three of his works in connection to the theme of collage. I'll now turn off my video and mic and hand it over to Sequoia. Thank you, Nahed. Hello and welcome everyone. So great to be here on a beautiful afternoon in Toronto. I hope you are yeah, doing great wherever you are. Um, I am excited to uh, speak with um, Khalil Robert Irving today about his work and I'll start by introducing Khalil. Hello, welcome Khalil. Thank you. Uh, Khalil Robert Irving is an artist uh, currently living and working in the USA. He has degrees from the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Art at Washington University in St. Louis and from the Kansas City Art Institute. His work has been exhibited at the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas, the Arizona State University Art Museum in Phoenix, the Rhode Island School of Design Museum in Rhode Island and elsewhere. Recently, Irving was awarded grants by the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation and the Joan Mitchell Foundation. He is currently presenting a large scale commission at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Irving's work is also featured or has recently been featured in two recent exhibitions at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, Making Knowing, Craft and Art, 1950 to 2019, and Nothing is So Humble, Prints from Everyday Objects. In the fall of 2021, Irving will participate uh, in the new museum triennial Soft Water Hard Stone, curated by Jamila James and Marco Norton. Today, we will be discussing an installation work titled At Dusk, presented as a solo exhibition for the 2020 Great Rivers Biennial at the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis. So looking forward to hearing about the work and great to see you, Khalil. Good to see you too. And it's interesting that we talked uh, for the first time almost 10 years prior to this exhibition opening when I was in high school. Yeah, you were a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> and so great to meet you then, memorable yeah. at the time, and really phenomenal to see um, how you've really dedicated yourself to making artwork and thinking about um, thinking about your life and your practice in really open and, and amazing ways. And maybe before we actually look at the first image, I'll ask you like to think for a moment about that time, maybe like when you were what, about 17 maybe, um, and thinking about- I think we met when I was like 15 or 15, 16. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so more uh, like 12 years ago. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, right, I think, no, I think, you're, I think you're right there, yeah, for sure. I mean, try to remember who you were then and, and um, how you thought about yourself and about your life and about your artwork and wondering if you could in some way imagine yourself now at all or how you thought of yourself as an artist then or as a maker then and how that connects to now. Mm. I mean, then I was searching for somewhere to be. I was searching for a place to uh, be grounded. And I think the auspice of both of us meeting of uh, the, the practice of being a potter and making with the wheel, uh, you, your life gets fashioned in a very certain way. And at that time, I didn't understand the complexity and the layers that which uh, pottery and a practice 
uh, as something that you flow into and work from and kind of flow back out of and realize and position and reposition questions and thoughts. I didn't really understand that in terms of what making was, but I knew I was searching for something or a place in which to ground myself. And I also didn't know what art was at that time either. And so what that meant, um, became of my experience. It became through my experience in college. It became through my experience of learning that what art could do or what art can do uh, is far greater and beyond uh, just this local position of me searching for my own becoming. And that has been a huge situation for me. That's been a huge part of uh, what's going on and what drives the questions and the problems and the, the fight and the desire and the passion uh, that I have grown um, over the last seven years. I believe myself, like I don't believe I was an artist until I went to college, in my third year of college. And so when I was in high school, when I first met you, I don't know if I even understood what art was in a way, you know, and I didn't know where I was in it. And my third year of college, I went to Hungary to study abroad at the International Ceramic Studio in Ketchikamit. And there I made a series of works where I felt like my intention is present. My desire is present. What I hope to realize through these objects is present. After making pottery for six years and being in art school for almost four years, then I realized I became, I was in a position of believing uh, myself as an artist. And so it's really interesting to now also be talking with you, someone that I met over 10 years ago about an exhibition that talks about my life since leaving St. Louis and my work since leaving St. Louis. And so it's this kind of this uh, compound time mm -hmm. uh, confluence. Yeah. And, I, and I think more than anything, it's just a really beautiful thing. Thank you for that. Um, I wanna pick up one thread of what you've said before we look at the images, which is the idea of, of being an artist or believing in yourself as an artist and understanding or knowing what, what artwork is. And, um, and so in my recollection of you as a, you know, as a teenager, actually is that you were an artist in this very kind of um, clear and sort of self-evident way. And so I'm wondering how, like how much we need to know about about what art is or how much we need. I mean, I think we certainly need to believe in ourselves as artists, if we are artists at some point for sure. But it, but it feels like, especially when we're very young, it's um, it can be so much just a, just a, a function or a fact of kind of existing or being in the world that that there's this other way in which you just are that even if you don't have language for it or a practice around it or a sense of intention or a set of beliefs around it it's just kind of how you exist as a being in a way yes i mean at the same time of meeting you i was also uh why a, a leader at the ymca i played baritone saxophone mm -hmm. i um, volunteered I was present in all the ways in which artists are present or can be present in the world or conceptual artists, I would say, can be present, oscillating between worlds and presenting questions, ideas and ordeals that then people have to traverse through when it becomes an installation or an exhibition um, or a work or an installation or uh, an experience or a quote unquote happening or a performance, something that wouldn't, it's like, it's like living in the ethereal and the ephemeral at the same time. And I think, and that's why when I described when I was younger, I didn't believe myself as an artist, but I, I was present. So what does it mean to be very present? Mm -hmm. So present in your life that you're so, you don't have to necessarily be aware of your own, like your own being, because you are, like you said, like being so self-aware that you are just able to live. And I think I mean, in high school and in the early part of my life, I faced a lot of violence and um, abuse from the world around me, but also in my own 
physical environment and I and that belief in being present was also through the longing of desiring love and needing love and passion and um, care and so how does one and so that I think making art and going to art school and being and realizing my own autonomy as a person and making art and recognizing the autonomy of the things that I'm making and able to create uh, allowed me then to also believe, you know, even if something was already present psychologically and physiologically, I could believe it in my heart and like through what I do did because another part of making ceramics of, or making art is the process. You have to process through to then be to to then be present with it or realize it or be aware with it. And so I appreciate your reflection and and it's been now moving home to St. Louis full time in the last year. Um, there's been a lot more room to just be present with that reality and accept that reality and feel nurtured and supported through that reality and be, and have space to be safe in that reality as well, because that's also a more, also a difficult part of it. You also have to realize, like you also have to make room for reflection. And I think that's another part that's inevitable about being an artist for some people, especially for me, making room to reflect and to be able to have my have room for self criticality in relationship to my self autonomy allows me to make you know make it allows a lot of us to be able to make decisions and and being an artist there's just so much more room for a safety net under making certain decisions than many other practices that's an amazing way to think about it i think for so many folks the idea of of being an artist feels like a like a risky uh, decision or a risky path in some way because it's um, uncharted for each individual. It you know it's often economic uh, peril that, <laughs> that comes with the decision or the commitment to being an artist. So it's a great way to sort of reframe that as as a a container for safety or as a as a way of helping to expand the the safety component. Yeah, and I wish like. I wish we also didn't think art, think about art in such uh, limited ways because art making doesn't have to solely be painting. You can make art from copy paper. You can make art from grass on the ground. Like you can make the ground, the ground walk. Like we have seen it be matured like Robert Long walking as an artwork. And it only through photography does that ephemeral act uh, exist and that we even understand that that is an earthwork. Um, I wish there was more roundness to the possibility of art and being an artist because I think that there would be a whole lot more inquiry and a whole lot more complication to the understanding and the reality of, of, of it. Does it feel like we're headed in that direction? Um, I mean, I think for some people you have, I think for some people to make room for themselves in the art world, there has to be that. Um, and I also think that it's something that we get trained in as you're in art school, you know, like I remember when I first learned about Damien Hurst and when he said, you know, someone told me you have to make art with what's around you. And he was like, well, I, I, I have $50 million laying around me. So I made that <laughs> for us to go. you know, uh, what is that piece called? Uh, that piece is called. Uh, yeah, I don't um, know the title. That uh for the love of god i think that's i have to look it up because it will kill me too for the love of god i was right mm -hmm. yeah and so you know he he i learned about him saying that and how then do you i mean in some ways i also like how do we not say something as a risk? Because the, 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 the connotation and the denotation of risk, I don't believe, and like from your, what you shared, it's not, sometimes it is what you are, not necessarily um, something you can control. And I think this reality of becoming an artist, uh, 
I met a woman who went to the Art Institute. She said, you make pottery better than grad uh, junior level students at the Art Institute. You should go to the Art Institute. So I, I applied to college and hoped and prayed and lived through the uh, trying to get a full tuition scholarship. And um, Richard Long, sorry, I was wrong. Richard Long, Robert Long is a different <laughs> artist. <laughs> you got it, no <laughs> way. <laughs> um, and so I went to the Art Institute and sh that opportunity of getting a full tuition scholarship was provided, you know, it was awarded. And I also tell people, don't go to college unless you get a full tuition scholarship. Don't, don't go to college until you can be the best you and present the best you so that they can then give you feedback on that part of yourself instead of having to you know just accept it because that's what they're giving or just because you get accepted just because you have acceptance you can also deny mm -hmm. accept and deny so where something can be a risk it could also be savior you know it could also be safety which i'm happy and i'm glad we're able to like kind of parse these things through because it uh it's a part of the real world. It's a part of our real lives. Absolutely, yeah, it is for sure. I mean, the, it's so much. Um, I think that's the 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 kind of the connector between the conceptual end of things, or the you know the philosophical end of of making maybe, or being with the you know the having a farm on your roof. Kind of, it's like it's the whole it's the whole span, and they have to function together. Right. I think now's a good time for us to start in um, in with some images because um, maybe some of our participants haven't seen um, a lot of your work. So um, I'll remind us that we're looking at a number of works of Khalil's from his recent project at dusk. And so at dusk is an exhibition. It's an installation based exhibition that has a number of individual artworks in it. So we're looking at a ceramic sculpture here with um, kind of a collage uh, element on the wall behind it. and. Maybe Khalil, we could start by you kind of telling us a little bit more about what we're looking at. This work is uh, from 2017 entitled Downtown Norfolk, Nebraska, in parentheses and italics 1997 or 1998, depending on the uh, venue in which I'm exhibiting it. And it's a work, only one work that I've made over the last several years that directly communicates or comes from this uh, autobiographical direction that the work can go through. We're seeing a slip cast uh, to go box cast in a white clay. And we see a, uh, we see a ring that has uh, imagery from lottery tickets. And so talking about my upbringing a little bit earlier kind of alludes to some of the things that of what the symbologies and the work here mean. And, Downtown Norfolk, Nebraska is uh, the place where the courthouse was when my father and my mother had a, uh, uh, you know, a, a little situation about who had custody of their, of me, and that life is a lottery, and so I use the lottery tickets as a kind of reference to this desire of hope, of uh, having a different life. But most people who get all the lottery tickets that I use are always losing tickets, so you, you're searching for, desiring of. Uh, another life from this monetary award, but you don't get it. And so I'm searching for or desiring a place of home or belonging. Uh, and this is kind of a moment. The sculpture is to capture that moment uh, in North, in Nebraska and in, in, in around that part of my life when I was six or seven years old. The wall collage behind it is a was made during the beginning part of the pandemic up until the installation of this in exhibition. And it has a really, really, really long title, but there are moments in time that relate to specifically St. Louis, also things that only exist in the digital realm or experiences that I had in the digital realm, like listening to Martin Perrier talk about his work uh, with the Brooklyn Rail photographs of family and friends that I'd spoke to on FaceTime. They're embedded in the work. And I've just been using clay, I think, for the last few years as a way to capture photography in a way that no other media really has access to thinking about the history and evolution 
and the technological advancement of, of, of lithographic or rice paper transfer on ceramic uh, and turning it in, then, and, and in industry, it's become a completely digital process. And so trying to use that in relationship to the poetic structures of what art can be, I can collapse all these layers of time together in one. Oh, okay, so you put so much into that. I feel like there's a hundred questions that come out of that. So um, I want to start with the with collage, though, because that's kind of the overarching sort of idea that we're thinking about a little bit today. And on the wall behind the work, you know, you've mentioned it's a um, like an, a, a literal collage, maybe we could say, that has a digital component and a physical component. And I'm wondering how you think about this idea of of collage or generating meaning through collage techniques, let's say, in in the ceramic form and in the kind of wall form, and what's the connection between those for you? Well, in the in the in the sculpture form, uh, when I was an undergrad, a professor of mine told me clay can be three things: it can be a pot, it can look like something from life and it can look like clay itself. And that just saying those three things about another entity or saying three things about an entity in that way, that is a collage because you have to associate three different things with that reference point of that entity. And so for my sculptures in their physical nature are inherently a collage because they are aiming to do those three things at the same time. They're also operating multiple materials uh, simultaneously through fire. Then they have the representational iconography in which they are working to uh, kind of, that, are, that they're working to collapse together so the to-go box, the pouring gate ring, the paint can that's smushed with the, the reflective metallic silver uh, knob on the side. And then in that way, there is a kind of referential collage In the collage on the wall, it's more like a mind sketch, but using Photoshop as a pair of scissors and glue. In the sculpture, in the scale of the wallpaper is not necessarily of the phone or of the screen in which it was in which it comes from. But for the sculpture, it is working to go to be one to one. And so there's a fissuring of experience that comes along with the sculpture that the wallpaper will not necessarily engage. Um, and how they operate together is a kind of pulling, a pulling on that reality that they are not one-to-one, -one, that there's a, there's a tension in engagement or scale and how one will receive one set of information and another. Yeah, I would say one way, to, one way that I think of that is that, um, is that the sort of digital practices often don't have a specific scale attached to them, as you you know, as you kind of indicated, it can be on your phone or it can be blown up onto a onto a wall. So there's no there's no stability of scale, whereas scale in really in any kind of physical sculptural medium, but in particular in ceramics in this way, it has a very kind of definiteness to it and a very kind of finite capacity in terms of scale. So yeah, they're they're sort of working working against e against each other in this really productive way. Right. I was just doing a studio visit a little bit earlier today and I was like, you know, like bronze, you could show a bunch of bronze, but it like wouldn't be really interesting. <laughs> but you could cast bronze in many parts and like make something really, really big and paint uh, it. And it looked so much like lifelike, you know, it could be so much so lifelike. Right. You know, I'm wondering if you, you mentioned that um, an early professor of yours described clay as having these three capacities being a pot um something recognizable or, or looking like itself and i wonder if they if that person meant those as sort of three distinct possibilities rather than three kind of collapsed possibilities into one object i mean i think i took it to the point where i could collapse those three yeah but i think they were meaning for my sake of education to recognize how uh, as an artist, I could use the material. I could use it as tromploy, or it could be a pot, or it could be a glob of clay, you know, and now it's right. very, 
it's very interesting for a lot of people that they're trying to, they're making like Brian Rochefort, unfortunately, and fortunately, I guess for him, he's making these objects that are goopy clay things. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm, a, I'm not, you know, it is what it is, but I, uh, I, I just think that there's so much, there's much room for invention and possibility that are outside of the singular, the singular existing models of making. Well, and I so love I that want... you, I love that you took a really reductive system of like clay can either be one, two or three kind of, and, and we're like, oh no, 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 it can also be everything, right? Yep. It kind of comes back. And all materials can't do that. And I was so happy to be able to tell that to the people in the studio visit because, and I think, and they said, well, is your locus ceramics? Is that like your primary? And I said, no, invention is my primary. And that's why uh, coming to the point of thinking about all three of those things simultaneously, um, it makes room for that. It's room for different meanings, which to, so the way that um, the way that I learned about collage was through, of course, through kind of seeing art in the world, but also through art history. And so, you know, we've been speaking a bit about um, when we first met around 12 years ago. And this work in some way you've mentioned this, the installation project is a little bit of a reflection about how, like who you are and how you've changed um, over uh, since then, um, which we'll get to, I think, more in a minute. But in that, in this sort of interval, as you've kind of matured as an artist, uh, myself, I moved away from making things and toward uh, a kind of academic approach. And so when I think about collage, I'm coming through uh, through an art historical training where it's really centered around that kind of early 20th century Picasso, Brock, modernist sort of European tradition to, of kind of Western art, we would say, and thinking about how the, the systems or structures for generating meaning in visual art shifted at that point from being, um, from being iconographic, like based on images, to being symbolic and based on the relationships between objects and that the or between images or shapes or forms and that the great sort of the kind of breakthrough as it's described in art history around collage is that idea that the meaning emerges through these relationships so it's not that clay has meaning as a pot or as a recognizable object or as itself but in fact what you did you you brought those three systems of meaning let's say into into conversation with each other and that that move in itself creates something new. It creates kind of, you know, new, new possibilities, right? And I have an undergraduate degree in art history too. <laughs> and I worked at Probably helps, yeah. Yeah, and I worked at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art yeah. uh, and provenance research and education. And so I got to be a lot closer to that. I mean, and I also have to say, there were a lot of gaps in my education nature of being yeah and the gaps in education more more or less i mean to be even more direct is like i was my faculty were all white and i studied abroad and i wanted to make work that related to some of these specific issues that the that the faculty could not address yeah and and didn't want to address and like almost persecuted me because I wanted to address them or engage in them or talk about them. And I, and my, my colleagues in school, like one of my colleagues in school used racial epithets towards me in the school and the faculty and the administration did nothing. Wow. And with that, I had to search elsewhere for education mm -hmm. in terms of contextualizing my ideas. Uh, and so I would listen to Carrie James Marshall talk at night I would go to class during the day and then I'd listen to Carrie James Marshall lectures at night in studio. Uh -huh. I would be the only person in studio. People would come in and out, but I'd be the only one there really working. And I'd get my second education. Mm -hmm. I would listen to Glenn Ligon speak, Lorna Simpson talk. I would listen to all these talks, Selma Golden talk. I would listen to all the people who I wanted to be in relationship to, or even um, uh, Ann Timken at MoMA and... Um, Laura Oppmann, I would listen to her lectures. I would learn about what was going on at Yale University School of Art. And uh, that also was part of the shift in art making for me that then catalyzed uh, making these works that are part of this series called the Street View series. 
And this is one work that was made uh, for that early, that first uh, museum exhibition curated by Bruce Hartman at the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art called Ephemera. Mm -hmm. And so this work was made specifically for that installation. Can you speak more to how, how this work functions in this installation in terms of this sort of retrospective notion of thinking about, about yourself and how you've changed or grown or come into being over the last time? This works from 2017 and it's the earliest sculpture in the installation. Mm -hmm. So we have a work from 2017, two works from 2018 and two works from 2019. And so Maybe. this shows like the first, like postgraduate school, what, what, what is a representation of something that I had made? Mm -hmm. And plus it's one of the only works that I hadn't sold from that time. <laughs> It's not a bad problem to have. So it was inherent that this would be the one. <laughs> <laughs> this is now how you understand yourself because of that. If we could go to the next image, please, um, maybe we can get a, a better sense of kind of the range of, of the works. And I'm also interested to hear you um, speak to speak to the series, the notion of uh, street views and sort of what you're trying to accomplish in the series. In the series, the street of these amassment sculptures are uh, representations of this compression of uh, decay or destruction. And in ceramic, for in the sculpture specifically for me, they are getting uh, captured as a whole, a moment in time. Imagery relates to the sedimentation, how the work may be collapsed or falling or caught. Maybe uh, it, it's like, space of being or its reality of being but then it's also about this like possibility of invention and what a sculptural form can look like and this work is <laughs> i made a title for it for my show but i'm gonna be honest with you it's really untitled um but this work is about st louis quite a bit and also um you see the silver arch in the distance, and you see this hexagonal jar uh, sitting with a lid. And to go back a little bit to collage, transfer, image transfers were made from my understanding and my lack of my ignorance in industrial uh, application in ceramic. Uh, were made to transfer imagery to not have to to alleviate the pressure on the hand painted to be able to provide access to dishware with floral decoration but with image transfer and then the hand painted would be more expensive and so here i'm thinking about the history of trade of object like you see these uh this hexagonal jar has the brand of the decal running along the side of the pour of what looks like concrete. But then you see these floral uh, motifs on the left side of that jar. And this object in relationship to violence uh, in St. Louis, that trade has happened historically across uh, scales, but also across times. And in this work, there's like this conflation of time presenting a historical or a reference to a historical object to something that's happening in the present. And can the history of violence and colonial violence and trade relate to the same kind of um, horrific white supremacist violence that's happening uh, in the infrastructure or the sediment layer of the work <clears throat> amidst being towered over by the St. Louis Arch? you know, or the reference to uh, the arch. Why do you think this white kind of hexagonal jar form kind of felt potent to you as a way of, of pointing to those legacies of trade and economic power and dominance? Well, I started collecting hobby molds. And then I started doing research on hobby mold forms. So like a ginger jar or a hexagonal jar, those forms all relate to a form from history. But do we have the lineage to talk about the trajectory of how those forms were co-opted, uh, appropriated 
and then used as a way to then have value in one sense that do not have the same cultural understanding or value from another. So European porcelain production factories co-opted, adopted, appropriated, and stole from China, Japan, and Korea, adopted it as their own, and then started selling it to the world as their own using racial iconography, racist iconography of Asianist people on their vessels, but also even just adopting and co-opting uh, blue and white as their own, even though Asia did not have cobalt and that was, cobalt came to Asia through Central Asia, it still doesn't mean that the cultural significance of the blue and white isn't Asian. And so this like double layering of appropriation and violence, uh, it was just a natural progression by finding hobby molds and then make, well, I mean, I make molds of things myself. And so then to come on these hobby molds of forms, I was like, well, shit, there's a thing called Ming porcelain, Meissen porcelain, but then I got this like eBay porcelain. <laughs> right. How do I, how do I operate in the, uh, in the eBay porcelain, but think about the history of Ming porcelain sure. or Meissen what does it mean for us, a European porcelain factory to emerge in the 18th century, be producing Asian-like vessels? Mm -hmm. It's like racist, one of the most racist things, you know? It's like, but no one calls it that. I had a, I, I went, I was teaching at Alfred University on a residency or a teaching fellowship or something for, the last, for a year, and they invited a Denise Lighty. You might know her from Yale University. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And she gave a whole talk on porcelain. And I was like, ooh, this is going to be great. I'm going to be able to, able to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, it was about commerce. It was about everything besides race. But it has everything to do about race. It has everything to do with white supremacy and Eurocentrism and Euro, the, 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 the desire for Euro dominance on the world. And she rejected all my questions and um, I unfortunately did not get invited to the dinner, even though I was faculty. <laughs> I got invited to the big group dinner, but not the, the, uh -huh. the more individual small function. Uh, but that is why, and through my time in, well, this work wasn't made in graduate school or it wasn't made at Alfred. This was made on a residency at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, which is the home of Dick Blick. And I had access to like go to Dick Blick and buy all these materials for cheap because they have a warehouse that's full of like all the things that people send back to the store. And I think your early art career, you have to like bounce around to find a footing to be able to get access to do certain things. And the residency in Galesburg, I was in Galesburg, their gas kiln wasn't hooked up. So I had to go to Western Illinois University to fire the work. And then I could go back to Galesburg and put the decals and enamel on the surface. And so it's just like, even in my early part of my life or earlier part of my career, early, I mean, I'm still in the early part of my career, but uh, in a few years ago, I still, my life in and itself was a collage. Mm -hmm operating in the world as an artist, like speaking with you today as a professional, but then going out into the world and then being able to be harassed and like treated as subhuman or inhuman. That tension and that pulling of a reality that's not necessarily, like it forces black people to have to be elastic and plastic and the similar desire that we wish that our clay would be too when we go to prepare to throw it on the wheel. But mm -hmm. at some point that, that elasticity should only be relegated to like love and passion and like relationships and developing a life for oneself, but not also how one has to protect themselves in a, in a world. And so the work is also working to collapse or c capture that together too. Mm -hmm. And make Closing. memorial and make memorial for it and make memorial for the perpetrator or a white person taking that away from someone's life. I wanna pick up the, the idea of memorial um, in a sec, but, but first I'd like to come back to, the, to some of the questions around, um, around history and ceramic history and objects, um, because I think a lot of the questions that you've raised are questions that 
that we're that we're working trying to work through at the at the museum and in a way they're like museological questions and art historical questions as well as like artist questions so you know we each come at them from our from our own whatever set of um sort of ways of thinking about some of these things but i i guess it feels like in you know most of the conversation around like say the movement of blue and white, like around the world is like, oh yeah, it was these, you know, like kind of Middle Eastern folks who wanted it from China. And so they sent, you know, the cobalt went over in one direction and the decorated ornamented blue and white porcelain came back in the other direction. And then it sort of went all around the world and everybody made it in different ways kind of thing. So it's seen more, it's described typically more as a, as a question of like cultural exchange or maybe like Denise Lighty said, as an economic story. Or right. a story, so or or really a story of like change and adaptation. That like, okay, you have this thing that's sort of useful. I'm going to pick it up and change it in this way that I find useful, or kind of right. I I do it in different like ways. Like in South and, America, like yeah, in exactly. South America, they yeah. use yeah. a so like, wear a yeah, white but, slip with a blue with a blue ornament with a clear glaze. Mm -hmm. So with that kind of practice, like say, so that I would think of as being from like Pueblo, Mexico, is really known for that. Like for that for that kind of wear, and they've been making it since the 16th century. It has to do with the galleon trade that you know came across the Pacific and then over to Europe. And I'm wondering how, like, say, so thinking of, about that kind of work in particular, how does that sort of fit into the fit into the, I guess, see, looking at it primarily through a race lens for you? It don't like it doesn't because when I because I'm really interested in. I'm really interested in focusing on the Europe because Europeans, the you have you have the negotiation and the travel like you described, but you also have conquistadors, you have church clergy, and everybody also like not just the pots and the and, and information of like making exchange, but you also have this forced engagement with you going to believe in my Christ. Right. You, are, you, are <laughs> right, for sure. you are you are inhuman you are beast right. and i am going to train you and so i i think with that negotiation and navigation of of cultural exchange it's not necessarily just cultural exchange when it also comes with ulterior motive for sure yeah it doesn't it, you know it's like colonialism does does spanish engagement in mexico like how did that stuff get there? Absolutely. And to miss the part about colonialism and domination and Eurocentrism and violence, that's what made that pottery available. Mm -hmm. Not the exchange, just the exchange of ideas. Right. Because it's, those the reference to the blue and white would never have gotten there in the first place. It doesn't, right? Doesn't this idea of exchange doesn't just exist on its own plane, kind of no. apart from all of these other dynamics in a way. Yes. Yeah. So it's like in a way. It can't, mm -hmm. and it's a very racist thing to also isolate the timeline in that way to tell the story through commerce only. Mm -hmm. And so that's why my works audience is other historical objects in a museum. The oh, audience no. is not the viewer or the Wait. person who can see it. The work is the audience is the historical objects that then will be then contextualized by my branching of these timelines together that then would make reason to why it cannot be just an economical or a an intellectual exchange between communities, but it is a Eurocentric violence that then ties and tethers the timeline to together the way it is. Mm -hmm. I want to just pause for a second and make sure that everyone caught what you just said because it's kind of amazing. So the audience, <laughs> <laughs> the audience for your work are is the historical or are the historical objects in the museum. Yeah. Right. I'm working. So, I'm trying. I'm trying to get the St. Louis Art Museum <laughs> to be my first ten-year survey, and I'm hoping to like have a main room of my show at the St. Louis Art Museum uh, be. Um, this kind of timeline, timeline like structure that communicates the the dynamics of the time that I'm collapsing in my work, and then using the museum around me to contextualize uh, what uh, is going on. It, it, yeah, that's amazing. So it is like a, what I would call a museological project. Yeah, that's amazing. That's why I said the show is going to be called 
Ming, Meissen, eBay. The Ming mm -hmm. porcelain, Meissen porcelain, eBay porcelain. You know, like, I don't, and so I find not in this exhibition, but in another exhibition, in a work that lives at the Carnegie Museum of Art, there's a ginger jar form that I found that looks like uh, a blue and white vessel from the Infinite Blue exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum that looks like my hobby mold form, but the ginger jar form looks very similar. And so I take images of the ginger jar form that was forced to become a teapot, European put pewter spout handle and lid fixture, but the jar was too heavy to perform as a teapot. And it says it in the museum text. And I said, well, why they force an object that has a very specific cultural significance to perform as something that it is not. And so I took the photographs and cut the spout lid off of that form put it on a hobby mold cast of it but in large pixels so it's almost like you could almost put the puzzle pieces back together to then re-represent the original blue and white ginger jar in which it is but i don't want to make remake ginger jar so i didn't put the image back on it one to one because it's not the same so that fissuring and that's what the digital realm allows for to uh, exist but in the work, the digital allows me to continue to pull that and make elastic of that reality or that representation. Yeah, that's where scale becomes elastic, right? And sort of mirrors yeah. the kind of elasticity you were speaking of before. Yeah, and if you want to go to the next photo. And this work is called Star Wars in parentheses Street Wars. And this is where, so the previous work was from 20. 18 and this work is from 2019 made uh, in conjunction. I didn't show it, but it was one of two, three works made from my solo exhibition at Calicoon Fine Arts in New York City in 2019. And I'm actually making a new version of this right now out of, out of a different clay, which I'm really excited about. But uh, the, the, the collapsing of poetry is just something that is really fun for me that this looks like asphalt, but it also looks like a starscape. That it looks like asphalt with objects in it, but it all happens to just be made out of clay. Mm -hmm. And I, in my studio visit a few minutes ago, earlier this morning, I, I told them, I said, and, and I said uh, earlier too, what, was, what did I say? They wrote in some the notes. Um, that invention is my is my primary medium or media that I'm working with. And this is like an example of trying to um, search and work through history. That's also a device that the Art Institute trains people, like trains you to think through as an artist or as a ceramist or whatever they're trying to tell people they are. It's about searching through history, finding a reference point, and then working through that reference point to make the art today. And so I went to the Brooklyn, the ball, in 2017 because I was a judge for the AXEL program through the NAACP, which gives high school students college awards to, or gives awards to the first kids to go to college. And I saw the Antioch mosaics at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Antioch mosaics are ancient mosaics that were used to cover public and private spaces telling secular, mythological, and political narratives. And I was like, well, if they could tell political narratives and tell mythological narratives in 5 AD, then in 2020 I, or 2019, I can tell stories too. So this work is uh, a poetic gesture and reference to and remember and thinking of that moment of seeing those mosaics at the BMA. Mm -hmm. Hoping so, one day to make these works where you can walk on them. Uh -huh. And to co-op and or like to negotiate what ceramics, what scale ceramic can arrive at. I made out a mold out of a module. And one work that I've made is eight by 14 feet, all made out of a module. That is one by two feet. And so I I I don't want to be limited about what clay can do or what uh paper can do. Uh, and that's why invention is something that is interesting to me. And one of my favorite artists is Oliver Lassen. Um, because all for Lassen has his team, part of his team is an engineering team. 
to, to figure out how to do. And, and that's uh, the space to do is what I uh, live and work towards in my studio is to is to work towards the possibility of becoming it or doing it but not it being the end of of it all so how does that impact some of the projects that you're working on or thinking about now and and sort of the making of objects well i, I haven't made any objects in a long time i've been working on paintings mm. uh, i have some paintings going on on the other side of the studio i guess i can show so this is part of my studio that's the painting side over there if and I could ask, right can, we, where can we pull out of the slideshow for a sec? Yeah, so oh, would you mind yeah, showing so that over here, over here is my painting side. Mm -hmm. And then where I'm sitting is where I cut up old collages that were on museum walls and they get put on these smaller panels. On my floor, I have a bigger panel there. Um, and then over here is like the, the, over here is the sculpture side of the studio. So back there, you see my press molds where I'm working on the, the, the tiles. And then these sculptures have been in crates for two years and I'm working to finish them for some upcoming exhibitions, one including the New Museum Triennial at the New Museum in New York City. Um, and then, I mean, and so you can see that the sculptures have gotten wild. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, and then they gotten big, really <laughs> big and really intense. I think we're also seeing the difference, like all the the sort of the layers and the accretions that you that you put on them too, like the yeah. kind of building up aspect. This one might be for the, the garner. Might need to buy this one. Uh huh. Uh huh. Tell us about that one. I might make a reference to a vessel that lives at the garner with these uh -huh. bases here. You know, I don't know. I don't know. You know, you just have to come to St. Louis to visit. Uh, so that you know we can we can have that conversation but that'd be good the tiles get pressed mm -hmm. and they, get, they live between drywall until they're um fairly hard and then i uh put them in a whole nother area for drying and so i have my press mold and my bag clay i really hate messy work and and there's yeah. someone here in the in the on the call today named deborah sloan and deborah and i met almost 10 years ago at a residency, at that residency at the International Ceramic Studio. So, you know, so it's like, when you realize that, when you think that you're not gonna live past a certain point and you actually end up defying all the odds, what does that mean for, um, what does that mean for you? What does that, what does that mean for, what your life can be and i've achieved so many of my goals already showing at the whitney um selling work making work buying real estate buying a home having space for myself that's all my own what does it mean when you already achieve all your dreams now what do you do and now i'm kind of at that point what do i i've like going to alfred i had to like survive in this like really weird place Booneyville. it was like really intense i met some amazing people like you know linda uh linda sorman who is a beautiful person and i love her and her husband seth so much uh, but coming out of that like or going there and being there and trying to figure out how to find my own place amidst this history of making an invention and possibility. I made my large floor work there. And so through that, what does it mean when you're in a tough place? The tough place catalyzes you to make certain decisions. But now I've started to make my own space where I'm not necessarily codependent on any other, in, on another institution. I am the institution. And so what is, <laughs> What does it mean for me to then make a safe space, not just for myself, but for others? What does it mean to have a studio, but can it become, can part of my studio become a worker's own cooperative? Can I influence local politics and uh, social issues in my neighborhood that then create a more safe space for everyone? You know, what can I do as a being that is beyond just the making of something and it can like exist in the world in a very interesting way? And just making reference to that teapot and that ginger jar, the Ming Dynasty ginger jar, here's a digital collage. 
with mm -hmm. that gender are present. And then here's the other side of the collage that has a photograph of the historical hexagonal trade vessel that I found and now I can't find the damn image. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where the image is, but can't that's find the, the photograph yeah. of it. <laughs> they, someone was selling it on eBay and I should have bought it. Because it's like, how do you talk about a history that, of things or of issues that you only have uh, ephemeral experiences of? But if you, you have the tangible yeah. objects, what can you, what else, what else can you do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What can you, what else can you really do? Uh, and what story, what other story can you really tell that defies the digital realm, that defies uh, objectness? But like, it's like almost like the true definition of relational aesthetics, mm -hmm. even with its own problematics. Uh, how, how can you, how can things be defined and redefined? I'm looking forward to, um, to hearing more. Yeah, you just come when my studio is all, all ready to go, you know, maybe next year you can come and visit because um, it would be, it'd be great. I'm trying to get more people to know about, like St. Louis is a historically ceramic city. Almost every house is built out of brick. Mm -hmm. uh, the land here is brick land, you know, it's clay land, it's red earthenware land. There was a river that used to run, I mean, there's a Mississippi River, <laughs> but but this land is a fertile land. That's a, a land of possibility. And I think uh, there's, a lot to, there's a lot to learn uh, from here and also a lot to still come from here, so. You know, I do, we're, we should wrap up in a little bit, but I do wanna ask you a kind of a big question that, that I've been wondering about for a while and that, and you've, you're, we're just speaking to St. Louis as a land of possibility and, also the notion of sort of living past the point beyond when you may be expecting to live at, at a time in your life. And I'm thinking about Michael Brown and Ferguson and you being from St. Louis and being a young man at that time and thinking about how, um, and I guess all of the kind of street views work that in a way, as you mentioned, serves that kind of memorializing function and that kind of compressing function. And I'm wondering if you could speak in a way, or maybe you have been in a sense, but I'm wondering if you could speak in a way to how, um, how like the, how the shooting of Michael Brown or the protests that followed or the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement um, sort of helped or contributed to how you, how you understand your, yourself in the world. Um, I mean, I've been black way before Michael Brown being murdered. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the, the hard part and the reality, I, I, someone asked me this earlier is like, with these things coming out, is it illuminating, you know, like, oh, they say with the, with the Tulsa race massacre being recognized and remembered, is that like illuminating the East St. Louis race massacre that happened four years prior? I said, illuminating it for who? illuminating it for black people because I already know what it was I already know what it is mm -hmm. so you mean I said to meaning I said to them I said you mean illuminated for white people because it's already a real thing I mean Inuit communities in Canada communities all over this this is what I mean like like thinking about self-isolating information solely based under one premise is a white supremacist and a very violent act. So I'm from St. Louis. St. Louis County is where Michael Brown was murdered. But St. Louis and St. Louis County aren't the same thing. But the world has been white, mostly white people are becoming to know that Ferguson is synonymous with St. Louis, but, if they, it, but there's one word missing, St. Louis County. You know, but it's like, the protests happen everywhere in the area. So it's like, mm -hmm. what do you, how do you deal with the metropolitan area? Mm -hmm. But also how do you think about what is a city? A city is a city, is a, a city is a point in a community, historically, is a, a city is a, a place in a community where the laws are given. And then people go from the city out 
to then give the law and lay the law down. Mm. So what does that mean? What does it mean to live in a city? And then in Ferguson, Missouri, the law was given that I can, I'm a white man, I can kill you at any time. I can do what I want and I can be acquitted for it. And then the people will praise my life. You know, I don't, I mean, for me personally, it is what it is. But I think me a, being able to have my own self-autonomous space where I can, I mean, people, if of course it can be infiltrated, but when I, when I put my fence up around my building and my land, I have a half an acre here at my building, who's going to penetrate unless you break the fence down, you know, but my, my business entity bought my building. So when people come, they have to, they see it first under the auspice of a business or a corporation mm -hmm. so that I still, I have a, I'm adding levels of security in front of myself. Right. So, but it's not, I mean, but I just wanted to say so that it's in recording, like I'm not living, like my, like my life isn't realized because of Michael Brown. My life is realized because of that first sculpture that I met, met, mentioned. Mm -hmm. Or folk in Nebraska living, had been being born to a mixed parentage and dealing with the reality of living with my white mother in a rural community. So it's like, you know, is I, I would be more willing, I'm, I'm more willing to ask, what did the murder of Michael Brown and his body laying on the ground for hours do for you than what did it do for me? Mm -hmm. I mean, but what did Rodney King do for people in 1992? Mm -hmm. damn near nothing because people still work in as business as usual so it's i mean yeah i i i um yeah i mean that's kind of that's kind of what what that is i mean i just work i just work to grill on the weekends at my shop i <laughs> uh, this past year been working working remote with david east at the maryland institute college of art in the ceramics department uh, and things are the way they are and they're constantly in flux and shifting so i'm just uh waiting to see um, what the next few months hold you know you would happen to that quarter acre of land uh, that my have, no, my half acre is going to be growing. Okay. It's going to be growing, and my living roof. I, I have to do the finish. Repair, I have to repair the roof a little bit before I can do the living roof. But yeah, next summer, my living roof is going to be full of strawberries. <laughs> that was one of my favorite things about Catch Commit was uh, in the spring the strawberries were mm. flowing. I was there from February to July. And I was, uh, and I went the summer before, and then the next year I went back again for two weeks. And then also a little bit about the history and the aid situation. <clears throat> I was, uh, in 2017, I was applying for a Fulbright and I was applying to go back to Hungary to learn about this material called pyrogranite that the factory, the Zsolnai porcelain factory invented or figured out a way to concoct a, a, a recipe for this material. And pyrogranite is a kind of ceramic that can be acid, that is acid and frost resistant. That's partially why you don't ever see snow on the parliament roof in Budapest, because the material does not allow, it is so vitreous that mm. the material cannot hold, it can't, it's, it's like almost as if it's so slick that water or ice cannot form on the surface. And uh, that is partially why and how I got deeply invested in the history of how hobby formed, hobbyist mole forms. Like what, what are they derivative of? Like where, where is the, line, how far can the lineage go back? <laughs> but we don't question why a glass tumbler is a tea cone with an open bottom. You know, we don't question its form and we don't necessarily question its function because it works. A fork was invented and it works to perform a specific function and the form 
is changing ever so slightly every once in a while, depending on the designer, but it is working. A spoon, the same, a bowl, the same. And so, but what does that, what does form mean when it becomes a product, a branded product? Enslaved people all around the world have names by people who which in which brand them. Mm -hmm. Just like porcelain, porcelain is not a white clay. Porcelain is a brand given by a factory. It's Meissen porcelain, Ming Dynasty porcelains. But the, uh, the material in itself does not come with that brand. And the studio in Hungary uh, is a very amazing place, but they have access to a factory's material. And I learned this in undergrad when my faculty member would put the brand of the factory's material on the objects he was making. And the factory called him out on it. And they pulled him aside when we were getting a tour of the, of the Heron Porcelain Factory. And uh, I learned, it, so you see, it's about commerce, but it's about a kind of proprietary relationship with mm -hmm. something. And enslavement and chattel enslavement was, was about a proprietary relationship to one's gain over another. And so the violence in St. Louis, Missouri is just the vestige of white supremacy existing as a kind of reinforcement of this hierarchy of object. And so what does it mean to, you know, what are people doing to make a difference? To make non-proprietary relationships, yeah. That's why I gave my honorarium for this talk to the farm, but it's like, it's like, what else can be done? What else could really be being done? Like my art is only a transportation device. It is not the thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's to get to that different set of relationships. And the work is forcing, like people peruse me working through trying to get there mm -hmm. in these moments of time or moments of photography. Let's see if there's just any more questions. No, because say nobody asked, no, yeah. Nobody yeah. asked. <laughs> no more questions, but I'll, I'll say thanks for like making, making work, making things, making work, making images, making collages, making stuff that, that helps to get us to those, to, to those different relationships, to those non-proprietary relationships, knowing that it's not a, you know the the sculpture or the installation is not an endpoint um, endpoint to itself. Yeah, and I mean, and it's great that museums are calling and people are asking me to do things because it and um, the exhibitions and the opportunities are what also help allow uh, to realize those things. Thank you so much, Khalil, for uh, for spending some time with us. This on this beautiful day. It's really, really appreciate it. Fantastic to hear more from you and to hear more about what you've been working on. Well, thank you for inviting me and it's so great. Yeah, it's really great. <laughs> Very yeah, good. So we make a, yeah, if, I mean, if you have the time, if you want to make the time, I'll be honest with you, I would suggest you make the time before things get too crazy because things are about to get crazy. <laughs> right now, we get like, with the borders closed. Can't leave Canada. Oh, right. No, but <laughs> yeah. we can make a plan. A plan. Yeah, we can make a plan. We plan is always plan. possible. Paper, you know, putting things on paper is different than having to do something. Don't have to do it. <laughs> you have to make a plan for it because that's where it gets tricky. Great. Yeah. Well, let's, let's let that be our next step. Okay. <laughs> that's excellent. Nice to see you. Nice Thank to see you too. Thank you again. And thanks, thanks for everybody everyone coming. who joined us today. Yeah. Bye. Bye.